Hi there. So I'm going to talk right now about section 6.3 and 6.4 together. Um, I realize that they are different sections, but section 6.3 discusses the multiplication principle and 6.4 part of that discusses permutations. Uh, but when I do the computations, um, I do them in um, always using the multiplication principle anyhow. It'll make more sense momentarily. Uh, one of the other comments that I'm going to make is that um, in this section, in both of these sections, you do need a calculator. Um, I don't have a calculator here, um, so I will explain to you exactly what to do and um, tell you which buttons you need to push on your calculator. All right. So, so 6.3, 6.4. All right. Now, what we're going to find is in chapter 7, we are going to want to know how many elements are in various sets or how many possibilities, um, in how many possible ways various things can happen. Some of our sets are very manageable size. For example, our set of digits we saw contained only 10 elements. However, some sets that we're interested in contain a ton of elements that, number one, there's no way we'd want to count them, and number two, there's no way we'd want to list them. So, what we're going to be talking about in these two sections involve something called counting techniques and um, we're going to learn how to count. All right, so to motivate this, let me give you a following example. Suppose you wanted, let me write this, suppose for breakfast, you had some choices. You could have a bagel, toast, or an English muffin. And in terms of toppings, you could have it dry, in other words, plain. You could have butter. You could have jelly. Or you could have cream cheese. And what our question is, is how many different breakfast choices do you have? All right, so I think you'll grant me that the first thing we need to count is how many different carbs we have a choice of. Now I'm gonna draw a little tree diagram um, we're not going to be really doing tree diagrams until the end of chapter 7, but this kind of helps prepare us. So, we could have a bagel, we could have a to piece of toast, or we could have an English muffin. Okay? So that's our carb choice. Now, in terms of toppings, well, what could we have? We could have our bagel be dry, we could have bagel with butter, bagel with jelly, or bagel with cream cheese. So just with the bagel alone, we have four different choices. And I claim with each of these, with our toast, we could have it dry, we could have butter, we could have jelly, we could have cream cheese. And similarly, with our English muffin, we could have those same four choices. So we could go through and count four, eight, 12 and say, yeah, we have 12 different breakfast choices. All right. Now, let's try to think about this without having to make a tree. I think you'll grant me that there were two choices that we had to make. Our first choice involved what our carb is, and our second choice involved our topping or lack thereof. Okay. How many different carb choices did we have? We had three. How many different topping or lack thereof choices do we have? We have four. Notice three times four gives us that 12. Okay? So this kind of shows you what the multiplication principle says. Essentially, 
what you do is you list how many choices you have to make. So however many choices need to be made, suppose there's n choices total. Don't let these letters confuse you. What's important for you guys is the process. But suppose you have n choices total and you have m sub 1 ways to make choice 1, m sub 2 ways to make choice 2, all the way up to n, m sub n ways to make choice n. Well, then the total number of choices that you have is m sub 1 times m sub 2 all the way up, some, up to m sub n, different ways to choose. In other words, you just multiply across. So, let's continue looking at some examples. Um, so suppose you um, are going on a trip and maybe you bring five shirts four pairs of pants and, um, I don't know, three belts. And suppose everything could match with everything else, okay? How many different outfits do you have? Well, I think you'll all grant me that we have to choose our shirt, we have to choose our pants, and we have to choose our belt. How many different shirts do we have to choose from? Five. How many different pairs of pants? Four. And we have three belts. You multiply across. So you have 60 different outfits. Okay? All right. How about this example? Suppose there are uh, five people and we want and, fi and five chairs in how many different um, arrangements can these people sit? Okay, so there's my five chairs, okay? And we have five people. So how many different people could sit right here in the first chair? Well, yes, in the end, only one person's gonna be sitting there, but at this point, we have five people to choose from to sit here, okay? But one person will be sitting down. Therefore, how many possible people could sit next to him? There's four people left who could sit. Okay, now we had five people, two people are sitting. So there's three possible people that can sit here, then two, and then one. You multiply across, that actually equals 120. All right, now one quick comment I wanna make about something like this. There's a name for this when you take a number and multiply by every number one digit down until one. This is called five factorial, okay? So for example, seven factorial would be seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. All right, now, Let's suppose we have five people and we have three chairs. Now how many seating arrangements are there? Now you might wonder, well, what happens to the other two? Let's just say that the other two people get to go home or something, okay? Well, now we only have three chairs. How many possible people could sit right here? Five. OK, 
okay? But one of them is going to sit down, therefore four people could sit here, three people could sit here, and again, as we saw on the other side of the board, there's 60 different seating arrangements. Okay, so we cannot only extend this to um, different arrangements, but we can start talking about codes and all sorts of different <coughs> situations. So, uh, let's talk about how about this. Suppose that there's a concert to raise money for some sort of prize. And the concert is to consist of five works. Okay, what are the works consist of? Well, there's two overtures, two sonatas, and one piano concerto. All right, and I just want to ask two questions. My first question is, in how many ways can the program be arranged? Okay, well, I think you'll grant me that the program is very different if you start with an overture versus a piano concerto, okay? So, again, I guess the number for today is 120. <laughs> so, how many possible pieces could we start with? Well, there's a total of five pieces. We have five choices, but we're going to play one, and presumably we're not going to replay any particular piece. Okay, so I've played one piece, so now I have four pieces left to go second, then three, then two, and then one. And the reason why I said the number for today is 120 is because that's what that's equal to. All right, now on the other hand, what if I wanted to know in how many ways can the program be arranged if an overture must come first. All right. Now, we still have some choices to make. I always write my limitation or what I'm bound by underneath. Okay, I always do that underneath and I highly recommend you do the same. Uh, especially when we're um, with our next example when we talk about, for example, phone numbers. Okay, an overture must come first. Well, how many overtures do we have to choose from? We have two overtures to choose from. Okay, so we have two ways to pick our first piece. After that, we're totally free. Okay, well, since there were five pieces and we've played one, I claim there's four possible pieces we could play next. Now we've played two of them, so there's three, then two, then one. So now we have only 48 different arrangements. Isn't that interesting how you make one stipulation and we go from 120 different arrangements to 48? Well, we can pretend we think that's interesting, <laughs> at least. Okay, so how about this? Let's talk about, um, hmm, suppose you need a four-digit passcode. Okay, now, something you need to remember is that there's 10 digits, okay? I mentioned this last time. And suppose I want to know how many different passcodes are possible 
if, well, part A, there's no restriction. All right, well, we have four digits we need to choose. Since there's no restrictions, we have 10 possible digits we could put here. We have 10 possible digits here, here, and here. So we've got 10,000 different passcodes. Okay, now let's put on the stipulation that it can't start with a zero. So no zero here. All right, again, we start where we have the most restrictions. If we can't start with the zero, well, there's 10 digits. We can't use one of them. We have nine choices here. And the rest, we have no limitations. So I claim we have 9,000 possibilities here. All right. Next. What if it can't start with a zero and no repetition is allowed? In other words, once you use a digit, can't use him again. All right, this is where they start getting fun in my mind. So, no zero, and for the rest of this, no repetition. All right, again, this is our most restrictive place. So, since we're not allowed to have a zero, but we can have anything else here, we have nine choices here. Okay, but will you grant me that we picked a digit? We picked one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. But we picked one digit, and whatever digit we used here, we cannot use again, okay? So since we can't use whatever we put here, I claim we have nine digits we can choose from here. Now we've nailed down two digits, so we have eight choices here, and then seven choices here. And I will let you guys multiply across. All right, how about this guy? How about it can't start with a zero, it must end in a seven and no repetition. All right, so no zero, yes, seven, <laughs> and no repetition. Okay, now I claim that this is actually our most restrictive place, okay? Because we're demanding that it must be something in particular, okay? In this case, it must be a seven. Now, the reason why I tell you write it beneath is because if you put a seven here, you'd be multiplying by seven, okay? Now, what number should go here? Well, in how many ways can we pick a seven? There's only one way to pick a seven. So we have a one there. All right, so we got this guy. Now, this gets a little funkier here. We're not allowed to have a zero, but I claim there's another number we're not allowed to have. And the other number that we're not allowed to have is we're also not allowed to have a seven. The reason being, because no repetition is allowed. So this is no zero, or a seven. Therefore, we have eight possible digits we could put here. All right, now let's go to our next place. This one still has a little funk with it. Now, how many choices do we have for here? Well, I can't put a seven and I can't put whatever number I had here. So I have eight choices here and then for this guy, I've nailed down three digits, so I have seven choices for that. 
and again you can multiply across. All right, so um, that gets at the multiplication principle. Now I claim actually when you're using the multiplication principle when no repetition is allowed you're actually computing permutations. Okay? And the point is with permutations, uh, when you see the word, I would always recommend you use the multiplication principle simply because I think it is a lot more intuitive. Okay? When you see permutations mentioned, the key thing there is the order matters. Okay? So when you're reading a particular problem, how do you know to use the permutation or the multiplication principle? Well, there's some key words that come into play. And some of our key words are, how about order? I think you'll grant me that if you're talking about something in a particular order, order matters, like for example, a batting order. Um, in how many ways can you arrange something? implicit in that order matters. If you're making a schedule, I claim order matters. Uh, other situations are like phone numbers, um, code numbers or code letters, etc. Okay? I mean, you can know the four digits you use for your ATM code, but I think you'll grant me that the order in which you enter those digits really does matter. <laughs> All right, so that is when they talk about permutations that um, you can look at the formula in the book, but I would always recommend you use um, the multiplication principle. So you might ask, well, how do we count things when the order doesn't matter? So that's what our next little topic is. So, when order doesn't matter, these are called combinations. Okay? So, just a little side comment that I'm going to make. One of the things that's always befuddled me about the English language is the following. You know when you have a locker and you have, uh, you know, you turn it to the right to some number, turn it to the left some number, etc. I mean, suppose your lock, locker combo is 33714, okay? I think you'll grant me that the order that you do these numbers matters. Okay? I mean, you can't say, well, I got the three numbers, right? <laughs> no, you got to do it in that particular order. So order matters here. So it's always really confused me that they're called combination locks because they should be called permutation locks instead. Anyway, clearly a mathematician didn't name that. It's just one of those things that always sort of irks me. So, back to math. All right. So here we are, we're talking about combinations. Now, it turns out that combinations come up a lot more frequently than permutations do, okay? At least in our class that we're uh, gonna be dealing with. Now, when do you use combinations as opposed to permutations? Well, if you're picking a sample, okay, or um, suppose you have a group of people and you have to select a committee, okay? Does it matter which order you were picked in? No, either way you're stuck on the committee, okay? The only time selecting a committee becomes a permutation or where you use the multiplication principle is if, say, one position on the committee is the president, another position is the vice president, and another position is the treasurer, okay? Presumably that would be uh, a very different committee, for example, if I was the president versus, say, my brother, okay? So, when you're picking a sample of something, when you're picking a committee of something, 
or say you've got jelly beans in um, a jar and you pick out three jelly beans. The order in which you pick them does not matter, okay? So those are the situations that we talk about where the order uh, does not matter. All right, so how do we compute these? Well, this is actually something that you do need to put into your calculator. I'll tell you the buttons to push. Again, I don't have a calculator, so I'll let, um, it's okay. I'll, I'll let you guys do the actual um, computation. But let me first say that um, when you are, um, the description I'm gonna give is on your basic TI-83 or 84 calculator. Here's the deal. Okay, let me first talk to you about what a combination is and then I'll tell you the buttons to push. All right, so what's an example that we can do where we're talking about um, various combinations? Well, suppose I have five books and I wanna give you three of them. Okay. Does it matter what order I give them to you? No, either way, you're pretty psyched. You get to walk away with three books, okay? So the way that we compute this is we write this as five and we wanna choose three. So that's red, five, choose three. Now your book also writes it like this. I don't know any other book that does, but they say it's a combination. You have a total of five books and you wanna choose three of them, okay? So how would you compute that in your calculator? Let me show you. What you would do is the first step is you would hit your value five. You would type five into your calculator. Okay, and then if you look at the screen on your calculator, you have a button that says math. You hit your math button and you go over to PERB, P-R-B, that means probability. And we're gonna be using this stuff when we compute probabilities in our next chapter, okay? So, then you go down to number three, which says NCR. So now your calculator should look like five NCR. And then you put your R value, your next value, which is three. And then you hit enter. Okay. All right. So another Example, let me go through some good examples with these combinations. I can show you what the formal definition of a combination is. And why don't I write that just for thoroughness? Um, so a set without regard to order is a combination. And the number of combinations of n elements taken r at a time is written as n choose r. One comment, don't put a fraction bar. I know it's instinctual to do that. And another comment, your top number always has to be greater than or equal to your bottom number. If you were to compute that by hand, it's given as n factorial divided by n minus r factorial times r factorial. Again, this is nothing that you're ever gonna do by hand. I would always recommend you use your calculator, okay? All right, so let's take a few examples. I think watching me work through examples will help you <coughs> when you try to do the homework problems. Okay, 
So let's suppose we have a club. And in our club, we have nine male members and 11 female members. And we want a five member committee. Okay? And I want to know in how many ways can the committee be selected if part A, there's no restrictions on anything. Okay. Here we go. How many people are in our club? I claim we have a total of 20 people in our club. How many people do we want to choose for our committee? We want to choose five. So our answer is 20 choose five. And again, I'll let you compute that. Okay. Again, when it's in your calculator, it'll look like 20 NCR five and then you can hit enter. Okay? So, we start out with this. That's a pretty nice little situation. Now we're going to start getting particular. Okay? Now I want to know in how many ways can the committee be selected if I want on my committee three women and two men. All right, so I need to make a quick comment here. <clears throat> when we are doing these problems, there's two words we come across a lot. One of them is and, and the other one is or. When you see or, we're gonna add. When you see and, you multiply. It's an important thing to keep track of. Okay, so we want on our committee three women and two men. Well, in how many ways can we pick three women and two men? Well, don't we have 11 women to choose from? And we want to choose three. And tells me times. And we have nine men to choose from, and we want to choose two. So what you would do is you would compute 11 choose three, you would compute nine choose two, and then you would multiply them together to get your answer. Okay? Now, something I'm gonna point out to you right now because it'll be helpful later as a check mechanism. Notice that my two top numbers add up to my total number and my two bottom numbers add up to the total number that I want to pick for this committee, okay? All right, what if on the other hand, I want my committee to consist of all men? Well, how many men do we have? Nine, and how many do we want to choose? Well, if they're all gonna be men, we want to choose five. Now, you don't need to put this, that's why I'm gonna write it in red, but you could say, hey, if there's no men, if there's, excuse me, if it's all men, there's no women, okay? Now, you may say, well, do I need to put this? No, technically you don't, because anything choose zero is just one, right? There's only one way to choose nobody, by not choosing them. So the blue right here is sufficient. All right, how about this? Now let's suppose on our committee, we want at least four women. All right, so whenever you see at least, at most, no more than, no less than, you're going to have the word or. Okay, I recommend you write out every step just so that there's no ambiguity. All right, we want at least four women. Well, in the context of this problem, doesn't that mean we want four women 
or five women. Okay, we're not going to get any bigger because our committee is only going to be five people. All right, well, the next step is, listen, we've got to account for all five people. Will you agree that if there's four women on my committee, there's going to be one man? And if there's five women, there's going to be zero men? All right, well, let's see how we do this. If we want four women and one man, I'm emphasizing the and because that means I'm going to be multiplying these combinations. Well, we have 11 women to choose from. We want to choose four and so times. We have nine men to choose from and we want to choose one. So this gives us the total number of ways we can choose four women and one man. Or, so plus, and how many ways can we choose five women? Well, there's 11 to choose from and we want to choose five. Now, you don't need to put this, which is why I'm writing it in red, but you could put times nine choose zero because in fact, we are not choosing any men. Notice again, both my top numbers add up to the total number of people and both my bottom numbers add up to the total on my committee. All right, let's do one more in this example and then we'll do another example. What if I want no more than one man on the committee? All right, now this is another situation. Well, let's do no more than two men. Let's just make it a little bit more interesting. Okay, this is another situation where we're going to have our magic word or. All right, so what does it mean that we want no more than two men? Isn't that our maximum number? So again, I always recommend, just like I've done here, write through all of your possibilities. I think you'll grant me that means I could have zero men or one man or two men on this committee. Now, if I have zero men on the committee, what does that tell us about our committee? I think that tells us that, oh, we're going to have five women on that committee. If there's one man on the committee, we're going to have four women. And if there's two men on the committee, we're going to have three women. All right, let's do it. So again, you don't need to put the choose zero, but we could say, well, it's nine choose zero because you see we don't want any men times 11 choose five or tells us plus. Well, now we want one man and four women. So it's nine choose one times 11 choose four or tells me plus. We have nine choose two times 11 choose three. And we have seen that term before. Now I understand that this is a bear to calculate on your computer, but it's certainly doable. And given the formula that I had put right over here before, I think you're probably much prefer to put it in your calculator than do it by hand. Okay. So let's go through one more example. And this example is about plant hardiness. And yes, I'm a total nerd. I am going to just write it in green because I'm talking about plants. All right, so it says in an experiment on plant hardiness, a researcher gathers six wheat plants, three barley plants, and two rye plants. And she wishes 
to select four plants at random for a study. Okay? So, my first question to ask you is, well, does the order in which she picks the plants matter? If it does, we're going to use our multiplication principle here, okay? But I claim it doesn't matter, okay? Because she's going to pick four plants and it doesn't really matter whether the plant was picked first or third. It's still in her sample, okay? So, my first... Let's ask, in how many ways can this be done? And part A will say if there's no restrictions. If, so let's do there's no restrictions. It's always kind of nice to start out with that. All right, well, how many plants are there? I think you'll agree that there's 11 plants total, and she wants to choose four of them. So it's 11 choose four. Okay, now let's say in how many ways can she select four plants if she wants exactly two wheat, one barley, and one rye. All right, so now we're being specific as to what plants she wants in her sample. Well, this is where you break it down into the categories instead of looking at it in general here. We have six wheat plants and we want to choose two. There are three barley plants and she wants to choose one. And there's two rye plants and she wants to choose one. Notice I'm multiplying across because it's two wheat and one barley and one rye. All right, next, what if now I say in how many ways can this be done if she wants exactly two wheat plants? Notice here, this is different than what I just computed. Because what we just computed said, all right, she wants two wheat, one barley, one rye. Here, all we know is that she wants two wheat plants and two other plants. It's going to be barley and or rye, okay? Now, <clears throat> when we know that it's exactly two wheat plants, I'll grant you, you could have two wheat, one barley, one rye, two wheat, two rye, two wheat, two barley, okay? We don't know, and so we're just going to be computing this in general. You don't want to go through every specific situation because trust me, it, it'll get really messy really fast. So, here's how we do it. We want two wheat plants. There's six wheat plants. We want two of them. How many other plants are there? Well, the other plants are barley and rye, and I think you'll grant me that there's five total. So we write that times five choose two. All right, let's do one more part and then we'll call this good. How about, we want to know in how many ways can this be done if she wants at least, I don't know, three wheat plants. Okay, so if we want at least three wheat plants, remember the sample is four, that means we're going to have three wheat plants or four wheat plants. 
All right, well, if we have three wheat plants, there's gonna be one other plant. If we have four wheat plants, there's no other plants. But I always recommend you write this step out. I think it helps organize your work a lot. Okay, so let's do it. There's six wheat plants. We wanna choose three. As we saw up there, there's five other plants and we want one. Or tells us plus. Well, wouldn't this be six, choose four? And again, you don't need to put this, but you could say, well, we want no other plants. All right, so that uh, completes the combinations and permutations se sections 6.3 and 6.4. Have fun.